The next item of business is First Minister's questions, and at question number one, I call Douglas Ross. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Today marks 35 years since the bombing of Pan Am Flight 103, which killed 270 innocent people. My thoughts and prayers, and I'm sure those of the whole chamber, are with their families, friends, and those in the Lockerbie community itself who fell victim to this senseless act of terror. Can I ask the First Minister that in this week of the SNP's budget, which has led to everyone in Scotland who earns more than £28,850 paying more tax than workers south of the border, in total 1.5 million Scots paying more than people doing the exact same job elsewhere in the UK, does Hamza Youssef think it's fair that a majority of Scots will pay more tax than people south of the border who earn the same wage? First Minister. Prime Officer, can I uh, also add my thoughts and indeed my prayers to all of those who continue to feel the impact of the tragic, terrible terrorist attack uh, in, in Lockerbie uh, on the 21st of December uh, 1988. Uh, this uh, year, of course, marks the 35th anniversary of that attack. I spoke to David Mandela actually just this week, and both of us were reflecting on the incredible courage that we saw uh, from not just emergency services, but indeed from the local communities. Uh, many of them, who their stories are not known, who are not named, uh, but through their courageous action, um, ensure that there's an enduring uh, bond uh, between families uh, that were impacted both here in Scotland and indeed those in the United States and across the world that were impacted. My thoughts continue to be uh, with all of those who feel that uh, loss. Uh, let me say, in relation to the issues around uh, the budget, uh, first and foremost, let's make it absolutely abundantly clear that the majority of those in Scotland will pay less tax compared to those in the rest of the United Kingdom. No ifs, no buts, no maybes about it. And this budget, at its very heart, is about values. The Conservative Party, in their autumn statement, chose to give, to give those uh, like Douglas Ross on higher salaries a tax cut of £754. In contrast, we are asking the top 5% of highest earners, like Douglas Ross, to pay a little more in tax. And by doing so, we're able to give our NHS over £500 million of an uplift, a real terms increase to our NHS, where, of course, the Conservative Party have cut funding for NHS in England. So, yes, we will prioritise an uplift to the NHS. We'll prioritise an uplift to education. We'll prioritise an uplift First to police and to fire. And, of course, it is the Conservatives who have prioritised a tax cut to the wealthiest, like Douglas Ross. Those are not values that I believe in. They're not the values Thank that you. I believe Scotland First believes Minister. in either. Douglas Ross. Of course, at its heart, this was a budget from the SNP which was about Scots paying more and getting less. That's what's going to happen eh, as a result of this budget. And these SNP tax hikes on Scottish workers will damage our economy and risk forcing highly skilled, valuable workers out of Scotland. Ian Kennedy, well, the First Minister is saying not true. He's repeating it. He's saying not true. So let's read to the First Minister what Ian Kennedy, the chairman of the British Medical Association Scotland, said. His quote is, one of the unintended consequences of this measure may push more of these doctors out of the NHS to jobs elsewhere or retirement or force them to cut overtime. We could lose those nurses, doctors and specialist NHS staff for good. Does Hamza Youssef accept his tax rises could force key workers out of Scotland's NHS? First Minister. Presiding officer, it is awfully brave, and that is one word for it, for Douglas Ross to talk about the NHS in the week that there's junior doctor strikes happening in NHS England, but not happening in the NHS in Scotland. Not only that, of course, 
We've made sure through the choices we've made in this budget, there's a real terms increase to NHS spending in Scotland, and there's a real terms cut to the NHS in England because of the choices the Conservatives have made. And Douglas Ross, every time we ensure that we have progressive taxation in Scotland, he stands up and suggests that there will be some kind of mass exodus from Scotland. Well, the statistics simply don't bear that out. The national records of Scotland, statistics from 2021, show that 56,000 people came to Scotland from the rest of the UK, UK a net in-migration of almost 10,000 people. And why are they coming here, presiding uh, officer? They're coming here because when they are here in Scotland, they get free university education. They're coming here because if they, get, they get free childcare, free school meals, because they get free nursing and personal care. Those are the choices that we are making. And you know what else they get? We have the best paid nurses here in Scotland anywhere else compared to anywhere else in the UK. No, Thank wonder, you, First no wonder we haven't lost a single day to strike action in the NHS here in Scotland. Thank you. Officer. Douglas Ross. I was simply quoting the chairman of the BME in Scotland and we get a rant from the First Minister. <laughs> let's, be, let's be very clear. The UK Government is providing the highest ever level of funding to the Scottish Government. Now, tight budgets are purely the SNP's fault for wasting taxpayers' money. Well, they laugh. It would be funny if it wasn't so serious. The wastage from this SNP government Members, on let's hear Mr. That don't Ross. Float, on doomed court cases, on Ivy League degrees for water executives before we even start on the bar bill. And as a consequence of SNP decisions, shops, pubs and hotels here in Scotland won't get the same rates relief as businesses in England and Wales. The Deputy First Minister is trying to shout down my question um, Mr. about Ross, hospitality. Mr Ross, I would be very grateful if all members could resist the temptation to contribute while they have not been called to speak. And I would say too that I think um, front benches have a particular um, responsibility to lead by example. But of course each and every member of the Parliament has a role to play in that good behaviour. Mr Ross. Yeah. I've got to say that the smug smirk from Michael Matheson and others on the front bench is really disappointing because what I'm, what I'm speaking about is as a consequence of SNP decisions this week, shops, pubs and hotels here in Scotland won't get the same rates relief as businesses in England and Wales. This is what the Scottish Hospitality Group said. Many Scottish hospitality businesses will struggle to survive and customers will see prices increase because of this. And the Scottish Grocers Federation said this. It beggars belief that the Scottish Government has once again failed to pass on the 75% relief for retail seen elsewhere in the UK. So, First Minister, why are the SNP putting Scottish businesses at a disadvantage? First Minister. And this is why, presiding officer, Douglas Ross has no credibility when it comes to economic matters whatsoever. Not only did he demand, of course, that we previously, that we previously imitate and copy Tory tax cuts, which would have meant we'd have £1.5 billion less to spend on vital public services. He demands we spend every single penny of UK government consequentials on business relief and tax cuts. If we had done that, we would have seen real terms cuts to the NHS, real term cuts to education, real term cuts to the police service, real term cuts to the fire service. We simply won't choose to do that. And if we had spent the paltry 10.8 million pounds that the UK government in their autumn statement gave to health consequentials, that would have funded five hours of NHS Scotland activity. We make different choices here in Scotland, presiding officer. Why? Because our policies mean that, yes, while we ask the top 5% to pay a little more in tax, they get more for it. And what we simply won't do is copy Tory tax cuts for the wealthy at the expense of our public services. Douglas Ross. Uh, last week, 
we heard a, a bold claim from an SNP Cabinet Secretary that world leaders were lining up to get advice uh, from this SNP Government. Now, it, it got me wondering, who, who is this that's been calling for the advice? Has Justin Trudeau been on the phone looking for a camper van? Maybe it's uh, Emmanuel Macron calling the Health Secretary to hear how to stream the Celtic match uh, from Morocco. Maybe, maybe it's Joe Biden asking for advice how to Members. deal with a disastrous predecessor at the heart of a criminal investigation. I, I don't know. It could have been any of those things. Of course, it would not have been asking the Nats how to build ferries or how to run an education system. And they definitely won't have been asking Hamza Youssef for economic advice, because he's making hard-working Scots pick up the bill for his mistakes. He's putting Scottish businesses at a competitive disadvantage. He's driving key NHS staff away, and his decisions mean 1.5 million Scots will pay more than people south of the border. Really, First Minister, is this all Scotland can expect from high-tax Hamza? Yeah. Mr Ross, I, Mr Ross, see, it, it, no, First Minister, sorry, it is very important that members address one another courteously, and that is using first names and surnames and avoiding other such names. First Minister. You see, this is the difference between us, Presiding Officer, that Douglas Ross is standing here advocating for himself as one of the 5% top highest earners in the country to get £754 extra in a tax cut from his Conservative colleagues. The difference is that I'm advocating to make sure we get a real terms increase to our NHS. That's the difference between us, Presiding Officer. I believe in an increase to our NHS, an increase to our education budget, an increase to police officers, an increase to fire service, as well. And what do you get for our progressive taxation system here in Scotland? You get, of course, the best paid NHS staff here Mr. anywhere Ross. in the UK. You get the baby box. You get free prescriptions. You, of course, get free nursing and personal care. You get child care, uh, the most generous offer of child care anywhere in the UK. And under the Tories, you get a Brexit we didn't vote for. You get a mini budget that tanked the economy. You get a Westminster cost of living crisis that's harming millions of households across Scotland. No wonder, presiding officer, the Tories haven't won an election in Scotland in over 70 years, in almost 70 years, and under Douglas Ross's leadership, that ain't changing any time soon. Question number two, Anna Sarwar. Thank you, members. Members. Members, I do not want to be shouting into a void, and I would be grateful that you carry yourselves with courtesy and respect. We have many members who wish to put a question today. Question number two, I'll call Anna Sarwar. I would like to extend my deepest sympathies to the families of those who lost loved ones in the Lockerbie tragedy 35 years ago. My thoughts are with all those, both in the emergency services and the local community, whose bravery and resilience after the event touched us all. And today we take time to remember everyone affected by this tragedy. And as we break for the Christmas recess, I would like to take this opportunity to thank all the staff of the Parliament for their hard work throughout the year and to wish you, eh, all members across the Chamber, all the staff eh, across the Parliament and of course the people of Scotland a very Merry Christmas. Presiding officer, this year started with Hamza Youssef as Health Secretary and throughout the year things in our NHS have got worse, not better. Over 425,000 patients waited more than four hours at A&E this year. Almost 55,000 of them were there for over 12 hours. And at the start of the year, 767,938 people were on an NHS waiting list. Now that stands at 828,398. First Minister, why is it that everything you touch breaks? First Minister. Uh, Presiding officer, you know Anna Sawar loses the argument when he goes for the personal attacks, which is what he does <laughs> regularly uh, and uh, very often. Let me give Anna Sawar Members. some of the statistics, of course. In the budget that we have brought forward, which Anna Sawar and his Labour colleagues have, of course, opposed, we are giving a record investment of over £19.5 billion to the NHS. That is a budget, of course, that is ensuring we have the best NHS-paid staff compared to anywhere 
in the UK. It's a budget that gives, of course, a pay uplift to our care workers. As for the NHS uh, waiting lists, of course there are challenges. The global pandemic has impacted health services in Scotland, in Wales, in Northern Ireland, uh, and indeed in England and right across uh, the world. But we are uh, making progress. If we look at outpatients, uh, long waits and outpatients, I can hear the Labour benches shouting we're not. Well, let me give you the statistics. When it comes to outpatients, the longest waits, those two-year targets, the numbers waiting over two years for a new outpatient appointment is down 69 uh, per cent. Uh, when it comes to inpatients, numbers waiting longer than two years for inpatients uh, was reduced by 26 uh, per cent. So we'll continue to invest in our NHS. Wouldn't it be good if Labour supported a budget that is giving record investment to our NHS presiding officer? Yeah. Anna Sarwar. <laughs> I was, uh, I was quoting Hamza Yusuf's record, and let me quote it again. You were the transport minister when the trains were never on time, when you were justice secretary, the police were stretched to breaking point, and as health minister, we've got record high waiting times. No, I'm not quoting Jackie Bailey. I'm sure even she would struggle to be that harsh. I'm actually quoting Kate Forbes, who sat round the cabinet table with Hamza Yusuf. And on Tuesday, we saw the consequences of SNP incompetence, waste and a failure to grow our economy. Affordable housing funding cut by 200 million in the middle of a homelessness crisis. Mental health services cut in real terms in the middle of a mental health crisis. And the fuel insecurity fund scrapped altogether in the middle of a cost of living crisis. This is the most devastating budget in the history of devolution. So why is it, on his watch, that Scots pay more and get less? First Minister. Actually, on, on, on my watch, of course, because of the actions that the Scottish Government has taken, it's estimated that 90,000 children will be lifted out of poverty yeah. this year in Scotland. And you know what won't help? What won't help with tackling child poverty is a two-child limit that Anna Sarwar now supports retaining. What won't help, of course, is a bedroom tax that Keir Starmer and Anna Sarwar now, of course, support retaining. And on my watch, of course, and this government's watch, we have more young people from areas of higher deprivation going to university than ever before. And yes, yes, there was challenges in the budget. I'm not going to pretend uh, otherwise. Let's look at why there's challenges. There's challenges because we've had over 13 years of Conservative austerity. Let me, let me read what the Welsh Labour Finance Secretary said. Briefly, First they Minister. Said, this is the toughest financial situation Wales has faced since the start of devolution. Our funding settlement, which comes largely from the UK Government, is not enough to reflect the extreme pressure Wales faces. So why is it that Labour and Wales have the backbone to challenge Tory austerity, but Anna Sauer and Scottish Labour don't? Anna Sauer. <clears throat> officer, officer, don't worry. In, in 2024, we're getting rid of them. What we need to do is get rid of the SNP incompetence at the same time eh, as well. Because I'm surprised he didn't talk about his so-called progressive tax rise, which is going to raise £82 million. That would buy you a fifth of an SNP ferry that hasn't even sailed yet. He is simply not a serious politician. And this First Minister is so out of touch. Members! This First Minister is so out of touch. He thinks if you earn almost £29,000, you should pay more tax in Scotland than in the rest of the UK. These are not the people with the broadest shoulders, but they're being forced to pay the price for his failures in the middle of a cost of living crisis. Now, presenting officer, 2023 will be remembered as the year when the SNP were found out. They have broken the NHS. They have broken the justice system. They have broken the housing system. They have broken the public finances. They have broken the public's trust. And they seem to have broken their party in the process. 2023 was a bad year for the SNP. Does Hamza Yusuf think 2024 is going to be any better? First Minister. Talking about broken, all Anna Sauer does is sound like a broken record, oh. presiding officer. Time and time again, he comes here demanding more money for public services but opposes every single revenue-raising power and policy that we bring to this parliament. And of course, that's the Anna Sawar of 2023. The Anna Sawar who was 
touting for the Labour leadership, put out a letter demanding a 50p rate for those who earn 100,000. What happened? What happened? That was before. Presiding officer, he, he mouthed. That was before. Members. So that the one thing that absolutely won't change in 2024, presiding officer, is that Anna Sarwar will say one thing one day and then another thing another day. Because we know, presiding officer, presiding officer, we know that Anna Sarwar is not a serious politician. He doesn't think for himself. He waits until he gets the memo from head office. And I don't know, I don't know if Anna Sauer has sent his letter to Santa, but if not, Briefly, he should First ask Minister. for a backbone presiding officer. Because if he finds that backbone, Thank maybe you, he'll First stand Minister. up for Scotland as opposed to standing up First for Keir Minister. Starmer. Thank you. We move to question number three, and I call Mark Croskill. Thank you very much. Uh, to ask the First Minister how the budget will support... To ask Think, first... Miss, Mr Ruskell, I'm going to ask that you begin again. Let's hear Mr Ruskell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister how the budget will support climate action. First Minister. Tackling the climate emergency is key to my government's three defining missions. Lies at the very heart of our draft budget. Our capital and resource programmes that we have committed uh, total £4.7 billion to climate positive activities. They include £2.5 billion investment in public transport, almost £360 million for warmer, greener homes, a record £220 million for active travel, £158 million for nature and woodland restoration, and over £60 million to anchor a new offshore wind supply chain. Uh, we've made these choices at the same time, of course, as being faced with a 10% cut, real terms cut, in our capital budget over the next five years. This is not just because investing in climate action is the right thing, that of course it is, uh, but it's also where the huge economic opportunity lies uh, for Scotland. More jobs, more successful businesses and greater opportunity for the country. Mark Cruskell. Can I thank the First Minister for that answer? That budget commitment to climate and nature is also a commitment to people. Record funding for active travel creates safer neighbourhoods. Investment in nature means more rural jobs. And funding for warm homes lifts people out of fuel poverty. So can the First Minister outline how the government will ensure that the economic benefits of this government's record investment in climate will reach the very people who need it the most? First Minister. Well, we are committed to a just transition to net zero. And that just transition is, of course, good for our planet, but fundamentally it's good for our people too. At the very heart of that just transition is in our people. And it's already happening. The renewable energy sector supported more than 42,000 jobs across the Scottish economy, according to the Fraser of Allender analysis. Uh, but we are also taking action to make sure those uh, who need the most help get the most help. Right? Free bus travel, which we will spend almost 430 million on next year, is cutting emissions while making the lives of our 2 million people uh, easier in terms of access to public transport. Our Warmer Home Scotland programme, which has already cut the bills in carbon for 35,000 low-income households with up to £700 million of funding made available over the next contract period. And we're investing a record £220 million in making our streets better and safer for cycling and walking the cheapest and, of course, the most sustainable form of transport. So Mike Ruskell is absolutely right. At the heart of our climate action has to be people. And that's exactly why we're investing the billions that we are in climate positive actions. Sarah Boyack. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, the Scottish Government is failing to meet climate targets in homes and buildings, transport and land. It still doesn't have a climate delivery plan or a green industrial strategy. And there are cuts to the energy transition. The Just Transition Fund has been significantly cut. The Green Jobs Fund is gone to altogether. And the 67 million offshore supply chain announcement was just a reduced and reheated figure from before, at a time when we need major investment in our supply chains to deliver on our green jobs potential. So how can the First Minister say that his government is tackling the climate emergency when it is failing in so many ways? Ways. First Minister. You know, we, of course, all voted in this Parliament for those world-leading climate change targets, but what's most galling is that every time we bring proposals forward, yeah. they seem to be opposed yeah. by the opposition time yeah. and time and time again. And when it comes to a climate change uh, plan, of course, uh, we will still publish that within the statutory uh, timescale uh, and timelines uh, upon us. And, um, of course, where the difficulty for Sarah Boyack comes 
that she's demanding that we spend more and more and more money. All the while, the Conservatives have car budget, and all the while, her leader has literally just stood up minutes ago yeah. opposing any revenue-raising yeah. proposals yeah. that we bring forward. So I'm afraid Sarah Boyack has no climate credibility. She certainly has no economic credibility in this area either, President Officer. Question number four, Evelyn Tweed. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to reports that Creative Scotland's National Lottery Extended Programme Fund has received applications equating to double the available budget, leaving some organisations and charities without funding. First Minister. The Scottish Government is committed to its continued support for the arts, as announced in the budget this week. We will reinstate the £6.6 .6 million to Creative Scotland for the National Lottery shortfall funding for 23-24, along with a further £6.6 .6 million for 24-25. All Creative Scotland's funds, whether funded by Scottish Government, uh, grant and aid, or by UK national lottery budgets, they receive far more eligible applications than there is funding available to support them. Uh, due to this competitive process for funding, of course, difficult decisions do have to be made by Creative Scotland. Uh, in the event of an unsuccessful application, it is uh, my uh, understanding that Creative Scotland will offer advice to organisations on other potential sources of funding that may be available, available uh, if those organisations contact their inquiry service. Evelyn Tweed. I welcome the significant investment the budget offers to the culture sector, while Labour in Wales has cut their budget by 10 per cent. As we know, culture organisations across Scotland are facing substantial rising costs. Can the First Minister say any more about how the Scottish Budget will support the culture sector? And can I ask what support the Scottish Government is offering to organisations like, organisations like Creative Stirling in my constituency, which did lose out on Creative Scotland funding and faces significant challenges to stay afloat in the year ahead? First Minister. On Creative uh, Stirling, first and foremost, uh, an organisation, uh, of course, I know and have been introduced uh, to by uh, Evelyn uh, Tweed. Uh, I would encourage them uh, to absolutely uh, make contact with Creative Scotland about potential other avenues of funding. Uh, and of course, I'll ask the appropriate Cabinet Secretary to be in touch with Evelyn, uh, Evelyn Tweed in order to see if there's any further support that we can direct Creative Stirling towards. Uh, as announced in the budget earlier this week, we are increasing culture funding by 15.8 million next year. This commitment to additional funding, despite the very ch significant challenge, challenges our budget absolutely faces. And let's put that into some context. In the Welsh, Welsh budget on Tuesday, their funding for support for the culture and the arts was cut by 6.5 per cent. The UK government has cut its funding to the Department of Culture, Media and Sport by 30 per cent in real terms between 2022-23 in the coming year as well. So we'll continue to work uh, with our arts and our culture sector to ensure that we invest in them. But where we can, uh, of course, those that miss out on funding, uh, we're always happy to provide feedback uh, assistance in order to see how, how better uh, we can support them. Question number five, Jamie Green. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister how the Scottish Government can promote and assist organisations that tackle loneliness, isolation and self-harm over the festive period. First Minister. Christmas, as we all know, can be an exceptionally difficult time. Uh, people can have money worries, loneliness, grief, just a few of the issues that people are confronted with during the festive season. That's why we have launched new content on our mental wellbeing website, Mind to Mind, to support people who may well be struggling at this time of year. This will be supported by a public campaign over the festive period online and in community settings, including restaurants and supermarkets. Since 2021, we've invested 51 million in our community's mental health and wellbeing fund for adults, with 3,300 grants being made to local organisations across Scotland to tackle social, isolate, social isolation. This very much complements action underway, funding 53 community organisations who are delivering befriending services and providing opportunities for people to connect. Social isolation, loneliness, mental health inequalities have been made worse by the pandemic and indeed by the cost of living crisis. And this government continues to respond to these public health issues. Jamie Green. Can I thank the First Minister for that update? Uh, for most of us, Christmas in the year obviously is a time to look forward to, but many people dread it. Grief, loss, depression, domestic abuse and indeed loneliness are the unwelcome gifts that the season too often offers them. Sadly, last year, 762 of our fellow Scots completed suicide. And this year, over 100,000 will be eating their Christmas dinner 
alone. And on that, presiding officer, can I commend the work of Marion Scott at the Sunday Post and Age Scotland for their incredible campaigning on the issue of loneliness. And can I also say... And if I may, can I also say directly to those watching this who may have feelings of despair this festive season that you are not alone. You can call the Samaritans on 116-123 at any time of the day or night for free if you need to talk to someone. And can I ask the First Minister what more support can the government offer, particularly those charities and volunteers who are always there at the other end of the phone when far too often no one else is? First Minister. So a very good question from Jimmy Green, and can I uh, commend him for often uh, this time of year raising uh, these issues? Because, uh, as we all know, that anybody in any demographic can be impacted by mental health challenges, can be impacted by loneliness, can be impacted by uh, isolation. Um, and I also want to add uh, my uh, my tributes uh, and thanks, I should say, to Age Scotland and indeed the Sunday Post and others who have done some excellent work in highlighting the issues of isolation, loneliness and mental health challenges that people face at this time of year. To answer Jamie Green's uh, uh, question directly, uh, that is why I think it is so important that the government continues to invest in local community organisations that provide support uh, from social isolation. Uh, and, and, and we do that through our Social Isolation and Loneliness Fund to deliver 53 local projects uh, supporting uh, people. And 70 per cent of that fund will be distributed to smaller organisations, 30 per cent to larger organisations. And those that funding supports a whole range of activities. Many of us will have seen examples of that activity in our own local constituencies, things like lunch clubs, uh, social group activities, community development, digital connections, creative arts, befriending services. And I want to pay tribute to every single organisation right up and down the length and breadth of this country for the excellent work that they do, especially at this time of year, in order to tackle loneliness uh, and uh, isolation. Thank you. Question number six, Polly McNeill. <coughs> To ask the First Minister whether and how the Scottish Government plans to increase awareness of spiking ahead of Christmas and New Year. First Minister. Right, can I uh, also uh, thank uh, Polly McNeill for an important question and recognise that she has raised issues uh, in this regard, in particular around violence against women and girls, on a very regular uh, occasion. Uh, spiking is uh, an ab abhorrent uh, act of violence. Uh, in the run-up to Christmas, Police Scotland is working with partners to ensure licensed premises are safe spaces for all, including through a spiking toolkit, provide advice to licensed premises and also to relevant partners. Uh, we continue to support the Best Bar None scheme in delivering bystander intervention training to empower people to address and prevent harassment uh, and uh, indeed uh, provide advice on, on, on providing anti-drink spiking, uh, anti spiking measures. Police Scotland is also working in partnership with other emergency services, with student bodies, with universities, with colleges, uh, and crucially, our partners in the third sector, to raise awareness and provide support for anybody who is affected. We remain absolutely committed to tackle all forms of violence against women, and we encourage anyone who's a, who believes they're a victim to come forward and report it to the police. Holly McNeill. Women across the country are being alerted to an increase in spiking. And in 2021, worryingly, we started seeing cases of spiking by injection. The most commonly used drugs being GHB, rohypno and ketamine. It constitutes the crime of drugging under the common law in Scotland or can be a statutory crime under the Sexual Offences Act. And as the First Minister has already identified, it's mainly women who are targeted, but not exclusively. The key characteristics of the drugs are that they're odourless, tasteless and colourless and can affect your memory. It can make it difficult to report those crimes. There are great campaigns, as the First Minister has already outlined, of your spite, but I believe prevention must be central to the strategy. Does the First Minister agree that it is vitally important to continue to have discussions with the nighttime industry, who are already alert to this? It is currently not uh, recorded as a category of crime under the Scottish Government statistics. I wonder if the First Minister thought we should do that. But does he agree with Don Fife of Glasgow-based wise women who asked that women remain vigilant, especially over the Christmas period? First Minister. I, I do agree with, with all of that, and I'm more than happy for the Justice uh, Secretary to look at the issue uh, around how that crime is recorded and have that conversation uh, with uh, Police Scotland. I mean, the heart of Polly McNeill's uh, question, she is absolutely right. Prevention is uh, far better than, 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 than cure. Uh, and it's so important that uh, we recognise that the majority, the disproportionate impact 
of spiking does, uh, I'm afraid, impact and affect uh, women. Um, and therefore, the work that we are doing to address violence against women and girls, that preventative work we're doing with boys, with men, to not just change their behaviour, but call out unacceptable behaviours, is something that I'm absolutely uh, committed to. So I'm more than happy to ensure that we work closely with Polly McNeill on these issues, but I agree with her wholeheartedly uh, that we should do more uh, to ensure that there's a greater awareness um, of, uh, of spiking, particularly at this time of year. Russell Finlay. Thank you, President Officer. The First Minister says he takes spiking seriously. His spiking round table was due to meet in October, ahead of this year's crucial festive party season. But to the dismay of campaigners and victims, it was cancelled. So while UK ministers are taking action to protect victims, complacent SNP ministers are doing precisely nothing. So can the First Minister tell spiking victims and campaigners when the round table will next meet. First Minister. Uh, I have to say I will not be the only one that will be extremely disappointed in the tone of Russell Finlay's uh, question because there should be uh, a, a genuine understanding here that for all of our political differences, and I have many di political differences with Russell Finlay, uh, he should not be suggesting that anybody in this chamber does not take spiking seriously. Exactly. We all take spiking uh, seriously. Uh, that's why we have taken uh, a number of actions, worked with a number of partners and supported a number of initiatives uh, in uh, this uh, regard. So we will, of course, continue to work with anybody, not just Conservative members in this chamber, but of course with the UK government on any criminal offence that they are looking to bring forward. We don't believe there is a need necessarily to create a separate, crim separate criminal offence of spiking because it is covered, as Polly McNeill said, uh, through statutory offences uh, at the moment. Uh, but uh, I would say to, to Russell Finlay, I'm more than happy for the Justice uh, Secretary to write to him in detail about the actions we are taking to tackle spiking. Here's Scotland. We move to constituency and general supplementaries, and I call Bob Doris. Presiding officer, Best Start Foods provides support, food support to families with young children under three and is more generous and has a higher uptake than its equivalent scheme in England. However, the Scottish Government recently reported that some families have unused credits of over £600 on their accounts or had not acted with their Best Start Food cards. Does the First Minister agree with me that, with the scheme opening to an additional 20,000 people in 2024, that it is vital that this support is fully used? And will he meet with me to discuss, with the, myself and the Scottish Pantry Network, to discuss a potential pilot project which could see food pantries, including those in my constituency, become strategic partners to support uptake and ensure healthy food is accessible and affordable to low-income families? First Minister. Of course, uh, the Scottish Government uh, would be more than happy to meet with uh, Bob Doris, the Scottish Pantry Network, uh, as well, because the points that are made by Bob Doris uh, are incredibly important. I'm very, very pleased that we are expanding eligibility for Best Start Foods in February so that a further 20,000 people will uh, benefit. I was pleased to be able to make that uh, announcement earlier this year. And while estimated take-up for 22-23 is 92 per cent, some people have not activated or indeed have stopped using their card. Social Security Scotland are contacting them to remind them that the money is theirs and encourage them to use it. The card can be used at food pantries. Uh, and in addition to funding being provided by, uh, to the network by the Scottish Government, Social, Social Security Scotland works closely with the Scottish Pantry Network, <coughs> offering drop-in services and appointments to support people to apply for benefits. The Cabinet Secretary for Social, Social Justice, uh, as I say, would of course be uh, more than interested to hear about what the network could do to promote best start foods. Graeme Simpson. <coughs> Thank you. The First Minister's gift to hard-pressed rail passengers was the announcement of a near 9% increase in fares. And that's way above the current level of inflation. Now, at a time when we should, we should be doing all we can to encourage more people to use the trains, why is the First Minister doing the opposite? First Minister. Well, again, of course, this is the government that has uh, abolished and scrapped peak rail fares in terms of our pilot at the moment. This is the government that made sure that we froze uh, fares uh, for a number of years. And again, we get to the contradiction at the heart of every single Conservative contribution. And that is that they are demanding 
demanding we spend more money, in this case, on rail services, but oppose every single revenue-raising option. In fact, they go further. They demand tax cuts for the wealthiest in this country. If we'd listened to Graham Simpson, if we'd listened to Douglas Ross, if we'd listened to Liz Smith, we'd have £1.5 billion less to spend on revenue. Thank goodness we don't listen to the Conservative Party presiding officer. Jackie Bailey. This Parliament passed the Christmas Day and New Year's Day Trading Scotland Act in 2007. Provision was made for Scottish ministers to stop large stores from trading on New Year's Day, subject, of course, to consultation. The First Minister knows, as we all do, that retail staff work very hard, especially at this time of year, with longer hours and indeed more demanding customers. They deserve a break. The SNP say that they believe in fair work, yet they have rejected calls from our store, the Shop Workers Union, to fully implement the bill. Why is the First Minister opposed to giving staff in large stores the day off on New Year's Day? First well, Minister. We're not, we're not presenting, <coughs> we're not presenting also, that is a mischaracterisation of our position. Uh, we do, of course, believe uh, in uh, fair work. We are uh, the party that is proud of the work that we've done in relation to fair work principles that we expect everybody, including the government, of course, to uh, abide by. In terms of the Trading Scotland Act, uh, I will, of course, examine what more we can do. I'm more than happy to work with USDA, uh, USDA who we have the most uh, respect for, but also retail staff. And I think it's important that Jackie Bailey uh, raises this point at this time of year in particular, uh, that re our retail staff do an incredible job, uh, often uh, in very difficult circumstances uh, as well. So I will see what more we can do in relation to the Trading Scotland Act because we, we are the party, I'm proud that we are the party of Fair Work Principles Presenting Officer. Rona Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. While Christmas is a time of peace and joy for many, we know there's often a spike in cases of domestic abuse over the festive season. Can I ask the First Minister what engagement the Scottish Government has had with agencies to ensure people are supported to report instances of domestic abuse this Christmas? First Minister. Uh, again, uh, Rona Mackay is absolutely right to raise uh, this issue. We all know, of course, and we all have a shared endeavour in this uh, Parliament uh, to ensure that we tackle uh, domestic uh, abuse. It's abhorrent and I want people to know that there is support available to them no matter what time of year it is and I would encourage anyone experiencing domestic abuse to report it to the police, to reach out to the ser to services uh, for advice and support as soon as they safely can. Agencies and service providers will be raising awareness of the availability of support throughout the festive period and you can also call the Scottish Government funded domestic abuse helpline on 0800 027 one, two, three, four. William MacArthur. Thank you. The MV Hamnavo is due to undergo planned maintenance next month. As a former Transport Minister, the First Minister will know that in the past, this two-week two refit period saw a Ropax and more recently a freight vessel providing cover on the Stromness to Scrabster route. This year, there will be no vessel at all on the route. What does the First Minister think this says about the Government's commitment to lifeline ferry services? And can he offer a guarantee to my constituents there will be no uh, repeat of this abandonment in years to come? First Minister. Our, we take our uh, obligations, of course, seriously uh, to our island uh, communities, and the budget uh, is undoubtedly a demonstration uh, of that. I'm more than happy. Uh, to, to have a discussion with the Cabinet Secretary and for the Cabinet Secretary uh, and the Minister for Transport to write to Liam MacArthur about what options there are potentially around the Stromness to Scrabster uh, route. I know this is an incredibly important uh, lifeline uh, route uh, and of course any mitigations that we can feasibly put in place we absolutely will put in place uh, when of course the Hamner vote goes for its two week uh, re uh, refit. Audrey Nicholl. Thank you. I welcome the significant investment of £66.9 million that the Scottish Government has announced in the offshore wind supply chain as part of this week's budget. So in light of the recent Fraser of Allender Institute report on renewable jobs, can the First Minister outline his Government's commitment to growing the green sector in Scotland as part of our journey to net zero? First Minister. I warmly welcome the study from the Fraser of Allender Institute. It shows that the renewable energy sector supported more than 42,000 jobs across the Scottish economy and generated over £10.1 billion of output in 2021. This report provides further evidence that Scotland is leading the way in delivering a green jobs revolution, unlocking the huge potential that our energy transition presents. Uh, and as I have already mentioned, I think in a response to Mark Ruskell, it's worth putting again on record 
that the just transition uh, to net zero is not just a moral imperative of that, of course, it absolutely is. It is a huge economic opportunity for Scotland and one that we are absolutely uh, ready to uh, um, capitalise on. And that's why the budget, of course, was so important in terms of increased investment to allow uh, to ensure that we have supply chains anchored here in Scotland. And Maggie Chapman. Thank you. It was reported yesterday that Anti Power, a battery manufacturer, has entered administration. Plans for a £190 million mega factory in Dundee, which could create 215 jobs on site and 800 more in the supply chain, have been scrapped. It's a huge blow to our economy and our just transition to net zero ambitions. What can the First Minister do to provide assurances to current employees, and how can we ensure we get the manufacturing facilities for the just transition we need in the North East? First Minister. Well, I, I, was, I was very, very concerned uh, to learn recently that Anti Power. Um, has entered into uh, administration. This will be a very difficult time uh, for the company staff, their families, particularly at this time of year. The people affected by the decisions are our immediate uh, priority. And the Scottish Government will do everything in our power to help those who have been affected through our initiative for responding to redundancy situations, partnership action for continuing employment pace. Uh, I understand the appointed administrator, FRP, will continue to look for a positive outcome uh, for the Thurso operation in particular. Uh, the region has a track record in innovative battery research, development and manufacturing spanning 20 years, and every step will be taken to build on the existing capabilities and associated supply chain. That concludes First Minister's questions. There will be a short suspension now to allow those leaving. Point of order, Kenneth Gibson. <coughs> Presiding officer, this week both the First Minister and Deputy First Minister have repeatedly said that the UK Government will cut Scotland's capital budget by 10 per cent over the next five years. But the Scottish Fiscal Commission and evidence to the Finance Committee has made it clear that that cut will be 20 per cent to Scotland's budget over the next five years. So will the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister now confirm that the cuts to Scotland's capital budget imposed by the UK Tories will in fact be much deeper than they have indicated? Uh, Mr Gibson, I am sure at this point in your parliamentary career you are aware that that is not a point of order. Therefore, we will be moving on momentarily to the next item of business. Thank you. And I suspend this meeting.